And we, the members of the Furious Flower Poetry Center, are really happy to present to you this evening, this afternoon, um, Denez Smith. Get my notes and get started. Those of you who are here for Passport, any people here for Passport credit? Okay, if you are, we are going to end promptly at five, and so at that particular time, you will be able to get the stamp. Those of you who are smart, brought some money with you, and there's some books back there to sell that we're gonna uh, have for sale, and that lovely gentleman back there will take your money. <laughs> I wanna thank um, the Furious Fire staff, Karen Richmont, John McRae, Hannah Vaughn, in her absence, for, and of course, uh, Lauren Aline for helping to put this event together. It is my pleasure to have in this space this afternoon, Denez Smith, who is our first poet of the um, semester. Two years ago, at the College Language Association meeting, uh, a friend of mine, a wonderful scholar, brilliant man, by the name of McKinley Melton, gave a moving presentation about our literary response to the killing of black men and boys in this country. As a way of emphasizing the poignancy and horrific nature of this growing trend, he read Smith's alternate names for black boys. I listened very closely as he read this poem, which began, one, smoke above the burning bush, two, nemesis of summer night, three, first sun of soil, four, coal awaiting spark and wind, five, guilty until proven dead. And the poem goes on. By the time he got to the end of the poem, in Melton's voice, I was weeping because it was after Trayvon Martin, after Tamir Rice, after so many killings, it was almost unbearable. And I went up to uh, McKinley and I said, I have to have this poet on JMU's campus. So he's here today. Smith is the winner of the 2016 Kate Tufts Discovery Award and the 2014 Lambda Literary Award for Gay Poetry. Smith's second volume of poetry, Don't Call Us Dead, will be published by Grey Wolf uh, Press next year. We have come to expect from Denez Smith fierce, raw poetry that centers on race and class, the body, religion, and justice. I know you are expectant to hear what they have to say today. So please help me welcome this fascinating poet to JMU, Denez Smith. Um, the first poem uh, I'm gonna read for y'all, I always start with this poem. Um, it is dedicated to the memories of Dwayne Gully Queen Jones and Islam Nettles, two black transgender women who were murdered in the summer of 2013. This poem's called Genesis. -y. And on the eighth day, God said, let there be fears. And that's the story of the first snap. The hand's humble attempt at thunder, a small sky troubled by attitude. And on the ninth day, God said, bitch, work. And Adam learned to duck walk, dip, 
Pose, death drop, Eve became the fruit herself, stared the lion in the eye and dared the king to bite. And on the 10th day, God wore a blood red sequin bodysuit, dropped it low, called it a sunset. And on the 11th day, God said, girl, come out. And the trees leaned in for gossip. The water went wild for the tea, the air tight with shade. And on the 12th day, Jesus wept, sad so many of his sons would shame his sons for walking a daughter's stride, for the way his children would learn to hate the kids. And on the 13th day, God barely moved. He laid around heaven dreaming of glitter, pleased with the shine of it, sad so many of his children would come home covered in it. The parades canceled due to a rain of fists and insults and bullets and rope. And on the 14th day, God just didn't know what to do with himself. Two. The Lord begat man. Man begat sin. Sin begat a new joy. A new joy begat hate. Hate begat Leviticus. Leviticus begat Sister Rosa. Sister Rosa begat that ugly rumor about the Wayne, but that ugly rumor begat the truth, but the truth begat the need to pray or run. The need to run begat the knees, and that's a kind of prayer too, but their knees begat his mouth splattered all over the hymn-colored dirt road. His mouth splattered all over the hymn-colored dirt road still begat a song. The song begat a hymn at the sweet boy's funeral. The sweet boy's funeral begat his aunt's still disgusted head shake. His aunt's still disgusted head shake begat the world that killed the not a boy child and stole her favorite dress off her cold, shimmering body, and that just can't, it just can't, it just can't come from God. Right? Three, a hymn. I am on the battlefield for my Lord, for my Lord. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promise him that I, I will serve until I die. I am on the battlefield for my Lord. For a not him for her. I am the battlefield. My Lord, my Lord, I battle, my Lord, and I promise him that I die, I Thank you. All right, uh, this next poem is about dogs. It's called Dogs. <laughs> One, Scooby-Doo was trying to tell us something when every time the monster mask got snatched off, it was a greedy white dude. Two, in 97, a black comic gets on stage, says, you ever notice how white dogs be like woof woof and black dogs be like woof woof motherfucker? Three. The dog upstairs won't shut up, and I've thought of ending his noisy little life, but I have to remember he matters, he matters, and if I did, the brown girl upstairs would cry forever. Four, dog, noun, a man's best friend, see, fetch, roll over, canine, good boy, put down, example, my dog died, I had to do it with my own hands. Dog, noun, a man's best friend, see, blunt, rolled already, handshake, my nigga, put me on, example, my dog died, he did it with his own hands. Five, dogs in this house eat the same thing we do. We eat greens, he eat greens. Fried bologna, neck bones, leftovers, um... He died from the sugar, the gout, 
or whatever came for Big Mama came back for the dog, six. Everybody loves Lassie, but what about Sounder, seven. Possible rite of passage, number 37. Graduating from outrunning the block's dogs to outrunning the block's police, eight. I too have been called boy and expected to come. Neil. Nine, what Animorph did you want to be? Do y'all remember the Animorphs? Say if I read that shit? Okay, cool. What Animorph did you want to be? I wanted to be the boy who turned into a bird, limp, and a dog's wet mouth holding me towards his owner, saying, I made this for you. Ten, the dog upstairs used to stop running his mouth, talking all that shit, talking all that shit. I can hear him up there. Fool, don't think I understand. He don't know that I got a bark too, teeth too, thumbs, and a terrible child's mind. Eleven, something about the movie Air Bud felt a little bit, um, um, the talented, obedient beast, the roar of an eggshell crowd. Twelve, dogs aren't racist, but they can be trained to be, as can the water, as can the trees, as can gravity, as can anything marked by a pale hand turned blood gold, some bitter king's magic touch. Thirteen, I'm the kind of werewolf who turns into a shih tzu. Rough, rough, motherfucker, fear me. Fourteen, while my grandma spoke on the clean blood of Jesus, I watched the hounds outside in the mud, horny for anything warm and thought of something better to worship. Fourteen, I stand in the dark bathroom and my tightest, shortest shorts, my Vaseline legs, the only things catching the light. I say, I'm a real bitch. Three times, clap my hands above my head. Nothing happens. I walk back into the club put my hand on a man's chest and it's a paw. 15, the gay agenda made cat dog to offer your child's gender to their seven-headed god. 16, a dead dog is a hero. A dead lion is a hero. A clone sheep is a miracle. A uh, dead child is a tragedy depending on the color, the nation, the occupation or non-occupation of the parents. 17, during the new moon, I switched to the A from the traditional ER nigger. I raid the farm patch, smash the melons, swallow chickens whole, spit the bones, ground down to dust, how great Jesus towards the scribes, great nothing. 17, rough, rough, motherfucker, rough, rough, motherfucker, rough, rough, motherfucker, rough, rough, motherfucker, rough, 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 18, dog, bre dog bread to smell the coke, dog bread to smell the bomb, dog bread to smell the runaway nigger hiding beneath the floorboard. 19, my man's dog won't leave the room when we fuck, won't let his lord out his sight, won't let his master disappear, won't let himself go hungry, won't let nothing happen to the one that brings the water, even if it means be being owned, being a witness to his hunger, or maybe the damn thing is just dumb. 20, stay open, stay, look at me, stay open, teeth, bad, bad, stay open, treat, treat, pant, wag, treat, good boy, stay good. 21, I listen to DMX, smoking a blunt, doing about 90 and a 55 when the cop asked me if I know why he pulled me over. I say, I'm just trying to be me. 22, the dog upstairs won't shut up, but I can't hate him. He's up there alone all day making noise. Must be the only way he knows he's not a ghost. Yeah. All right, uh, next one. Okay, cool. Uh, so this next poem is called, Ooh, you look like. Usually heard in the context of trying to receive services from a service industry employee when you make it to the front of the line and said employee is ringing you up and looks upon your face and sees a face not yours and so says, I know you, don't I? To which you say, maybe. You went to Central, to which she says, nah, but you know Shanice, but you don't know any Shanices particularly well, so you say, nah, but then her face lights up and fingers snap the way your mamas do when she has an epiphany and she says, oh! You look like Kenneth, and so calls over Tasha to confirm that you indeed do look like Kenneth. To which Tasha says, hell yeah, dragging out the whole thing to let you know indeed how much you look like the man that you do not know. <laughs> In this whole moment, you hate. Not because of this small little ritual of looking like someone, but because the whole time you ask yourself just what the fuck does Kenneth look like? And so, <laughs> 
And so you take to the phone book to look up any man named Kenneth Butt upon realizing that A, the phone book still exists, and B, that it's listed by last name. You take to the internet to look up every black man in the metropolitan area named Kenneth, Kenny, or Ken with only minimal breaks to watch a little bit of porn, but knowing that Photoshop is really user-friendly nowadays, you decide to find Kenneth. And over the course of three months of sleepless nights of waiting outside the homes and jobs of every black Kenneth in town, and 19 visits to prison for the 19 black Kenneths in prison, and tracking down two black Kenneths who ain't been home in a while, and laying six flowers on six grades with only minimal breaks to watch porn and only having one situation get a little bit weird when Kenneth 47 caught you looking at more than his face in that restroom you followed him into you conclude that that nigga Kenneth looks nothing like you Tasha be lying fucking Tasha Cool. Um, so one of my biggest plights as a, a queer person, a queer man in this, uh, in this day and age is, um, is men who are queer but don't want to be. Um, but I love them. Those, those, it's called down low where I come from. Um, you know, dudes who are, are like gay but only when nobody's looking. Um, so I wrote this for them. At the down low house party. Don't expect no nigga to dance. We drink hen, hold the wall, graze an elbow, and pray it lasts forever. Everybody want to touch a nigga, but don't. We say, what's good, meaning I could love you until my jaw is but memory. We say, yo, meaning let my body be the falcon's talon and your body be the soft innards of goats, but we mostly say nothing. Just sip some good brown, trying to get drunk with permission, and sometime, between here and being straight again, some sweet-boned, glittering boy shows up, starts voguing and shit. His sharp hips pierce our desire, make our mouths water and water, and we call him faggot, meaning bravery. Faggot, meaning I often dream of you, flesh damp and confused for mine. We say faggot, meaning hail the queen, hail the queen. Faggot, meaning I've waited ages to dance with you. Uh, stop. No, no, no. We got shit to do. All right. Um, so, uh, what time is it? Okay. Uh, uh, back in the 90s, there were these things called music videos. Um, I greatly enjoyed them. Um, and it, of, of that, my favorite genre of music video um, was the 90s, like, R&B diva music video. Um, because it usually was just like some like black woman walking around in a fabulous gown through a very expensive house, sometimes with wine, um, like just looking sad because of some man that we may or may not see throughout the entire video. If you do see him, it's like usually the back of his head. Um, and I, I think I most closely identify with that. Um, like if I was, if I had a gender, it would be 90s R&B music video. Um, and so I wrote a poem about it. Um, uh, so I can look at myself. Uh, so this is, uh, this is called Self-Portrait as a 90s R&B video or Dark Child Na Na, which is how the Destiny Child song Say My Name starts. If you know the part, cool. All right. Lately, I've been opening doors in slow motion and find myself often wearing loose white silks in rooms packed with wind machines and dusk. I have a tendency to be sad thinking about all the problems I, oh wait, I have, a tendency to be, I have a tendency to be sad near windows thinking about all the problems I have with my man, with his trifling light skin ass. My man is more a concept than anything. At dinner, I watched him spill red pepper soup onto his powder blue Brooks Brother button down and asked, why don't you love me anymore? I sit on the couch drinking a wine glass full of milk, cry in ways that make me both gorgeous and fuckable. My girlfriends come over. We, buy, uh, we burn his suits to light our spliffs, buy Gucci heels with his credit cards and stomp out all his shit. My best friend, she say that I need to get over him, say that he ain't even real, but what does she know? I got all this house to walk through, all these gowns to cry on, all these windows to watch the rain through. There must be a man in this house who loves me too much to do it well. There's a room in my basement filled with water and gold, and that's it. <laughs> water up to my well-managed waist, gold link chains that wrap around my ankles like boa constrictors or the hands of someone around a neck they used to love to bite and cry for God into. I dip my head in, let even my hair get wet, 
and rise out the water a hood Venus, Aphrodite, bitch god, with iced out chains dangling from my neck and arms, my nipples and ill-na-na covered just so. I could be a trophy for an award show only niggas know. Every rapper's favorite ex, 1996 given a body and he don't want this. I walk into my foyer because I have a foyer and say, who is she motherfucker? Turn it off. <laughs> I swear even the hydrangeas flinch. My man's so fake he don't exist. My girlfriend was right. My man's all in my head and it's a bad head. Tomorrow, after I run and spend some time studying the mirror's wisdom, I'll come back and burn this motherfucker down. Like left I would, like any good wife. Whatever survives the blaze will be my kingdom. I hope I make it. Uh, can I do a new poem for y'all? Yeah. Cool. Uh, wait, but which new one though? Denez, you have to pick one. Um, <laughs> Is that what I want? Nah. Nah, not that one either. Um, oh, this is a weird one. I don't know what the hell this poem is about. Um, I just wrote it like yesterday. Cool, y'all can help me figure it out. I don't have a title for this one, so if you have a title for it, let me know. All right. It's a really weird poem. I don't know what the fuck to do with this. All right. The poem opens and out falls a man. A poem is a cousin to the egg. The poem opens and a man falls out. He is nude and surrounded by a gel. One could say he is a yoke, bright, almost alive, almost sun, not quite anything. The man lays there, red-eyed in the white of the poem, suspended, dead maybe, if a yoke can be dead, if we crack the egg and out falls the hen's hope. But sometimes there, in the skillet, not a yoke, but a wet bird, yellow drenched, marinated in cold womb, then cracked twice against the counter, dropped into the over hot butter, and now presenting a problem, unscramblable, salted in its own deadness, how quick breakfast becomes a funeral. I view the body of the bird, which if hatched would have still ended up here in the skillet, long dead with surprised bones who must flinch at the heat's sudden return and its familiar leaving as I push the small bird slightly browned in butter into the trash here, I think about chicken and their eggs, how I delight in the taste of their kind, um, meat of their bodies and meat of what would be their bodies, and this might be the only way a chicken has ever made it into a home and received a human's burial. The trash, sure, a hated person's burial, but a somebody, a burial. I th and I throw the poem away and the man that came with it. He has my face, each poem a little thing that has my face, and sometimes just a yellow, unfertilized song I feed to my countrymen until they get sick of all that yellow fluff and come at my neck for my wings. Weird little poem. I don't know what the fuck it's about. All right. All right, cool. Uh, so this next poem is after Okay, um, so one time I was chilling in my grandma's backyard, um, and there was this flower that had uh, bloomed, like the stem of it was like in our neighbor's yard, but it had like whizzled through the fence. Whizzle, that's a nice word. Um, it had like whizzled through the fence, and like was like, its head was like in our yard, and it was very beautiful. And I took a whole bunch of selfies with it, and then wrote a poem. Um, so this is called, uh, it's a very aptly named title. Um, After seeing the flower who bloomed through the fence into my grandmother's yard. Aptly titled. Flowers is niggas too. This here nigga grown snug into a chokehold to set him free would mean to behead him. Some would split a nigga neck, let him bleed out behind the ear Tupac of a flower. White picket chains clasped around the throat, descendant of a field that picked itself, 
almost miraculous and out of context, like niggas in Utah. Mo Grand for his quarantine. How white niggas look at me sometimes, peddled nigga child special only because it is. Divorced from the garden, hands plucking at my weedish bouquet. We love niggas, we love them not. Prisoner of wood, an accident. He leaned himself into meaning, trapped in observation, well bloomed nigga. Annual like the death of aunties locked in and strangled pretty nosy ass flower. Peeking his head in search of greener grass, now stuck in the guillotine that won't fall, assimilated into the barrier like a black cop of a flower, shimmied into place, and now you can only leave this place dead. Silly nigga, fences are for fences. You trespass, and now you live here. Look at you. The fence wears you like a single yellow hair. You wear the fence like a boy in his mother's blue gown, how he almost drowns. What are you doing here? Living flower in a crisscross dead tree. What are you running from still rooted where you started? Do they, are, what ghost haunts your dirt? Do they slick around your feet gray as worms? Do they make your mind feel like smoke? Did you stick your head out the window just to breathe, only to have your head bloom bigger than the window? Do I pluck you now or let you wilt on your own? My nigga, my nigga, is death any easier if you can call your killer kin. Um, this poem, what poem did I say I was gonna do next? Yeah, I don't wanna do that one. Um, next one. Uh, cool. Um, so I got very sick of writing elegies for people um, for a long time, and so then, um, I wrote these things called like not elegies, um, which are elegies, I guess. Um, and I think I'm gonna read one of them. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, not an elegy from Mike Brown. I'm sick of writing this poem, but bring the boy, his new name, his same old body, ordinary black dead thing, bring him and we will mourn until we forget what we are mourning. And isn't that what being black is about? Not the joy of it, but the feeling you get when you're looking at your child, turning your head, then poof, no more child. That feeling, that's black. Think, once a white girl was kidnapped and that's the Trojan War. Later, up the block, Troy got shot and that was Tuesday. Are we not worthy of a city of ash, of a thousand ships launched because we are missed always? Something deserves to be burned. It's never the right thing. I demand a war to bring the boy back, no matter what his name is this time. I at least demand a song ahead. A song will do for now. But look at what the Lord has made above Missouri Sweet smoke. Uh, I would like to take a moment to thank my mother for never attempting to get me help when I opened a door that she didn't know I knew and became maybe a little closer to a daughter she always wanted, as I killed her son to give birth to her son, as I entered a land that God turned to salt with my tongue leading my feet, as I shuddered into a new skin, not his, not mine, as I bloomed cottonwood in its cummy scent in the air, flower like a stale towel, boy turned rag, turned God, she turned to God, and thank Jesus, Jesus didn't tell her to beat the boy back into me or to fill me with thunder until I hungered only for pussy, until I wasn't pussy, until prayer was nailed across my throat, until sugar in my blood turned to pig skin, beer, more blood, whatever men obsessed with being men think they are made of, whatever God they pray to who tells them that they must knuckle and skitter away from the open palm of a man-shaped thing, mouth open, another mouth open, a boy is a kind of hallway, if a hallway could exist without a building, a tunnel, I guess, so thank you, mama, for not filling me with dirt until I knew what I was but couldn't, but couldn't be it. How bottled water must remember when it was the sky and Atlantic. How even the smallest dogs still have the instinct to hunt and how, how you can take the faggot out the boy but that won't stop the boy from burning. <laughs> eh. 
many, how many spawns can I do? OK, cool. Uh, like three more pumps. All right. uh, this next one's a little, a little longer, All right. um, but it should be fine. Um, things you need to know about this pump. Uh, one of the sections uh, mentions Diamond or um, is addressed to Diamond Reynolds. Um, Diamond Reynolds uh, is the girlfriend of Philando Castillo, who was a black man murdered um, very unjustly in Minnesota um, this summer during a routine traffic stop. Um, she recorded it, put it on Facebook. Um, it's after JFK. One, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask if your country is your country. Ask if your country belongs to your country folks. Ask if your country is addicted to blood. Ask if your country is addicted to forgetting. Ask if your country is an oil and power fiend. Ask if your country shakes at night, starving for bodies. If bodies mean your country, keep to go on being your country in the same old ways. Ask if your country was built on stolen land and stolen breath. If democracy is a chain tight as skin around your neck. Uh, ask if your comfort means elsewhere, someone is burying a daughter. Ask if your comfort means round the corner, a man is dead because a cop mistook his body for a gun. Ask if your comfort means broke schools and food deserts on the other side of town. Ask if your new apartment used to belong to someone who couldn't afford to look like you. Ask yourself all these, if all these things you're scared to admit are shovels slowly filling up a uh, brown boy's throat, too. All lives don't matter the same as all lives. Some lives matter only to themselves. Some lives matter only on they block. Some lives matter of fact, and some lives up for debate. All lives matter to someone, but what about this life of mine, honey colored and black as it be? What my life mean to you? Am I talking to you? Do you wish me justice, or do you wish I would just shut up already? Vanish already. Three, Diamond Reynolds is a hero where no one should have to be a hero. Steady as she can be with a daughter in the back seat and Philando slowly becoming a memory right next to her. Gun still pointed at his body. Cop outside the window scared of a man he already turned into a myth. Thinks him zombie when he already proved him ghost. Diamond be diamond strong in a world that treats our people like bad water. Diamond unbreakable, but why they test her like that? Why they send bullets through our body like they trying to see if we real or just bad dream? Why they nightmare us into beast? Why they comfort the cops but not the family? Why administrative leave? Why they look up the record before they check the pulse? Why they spin the story before they call the ambulance? Why they more worried about getting caught than they worried about the killing? Why they protect and serve themselves from us? Why they want us to apologize for being in the way of their bullets? What good are police? What is the American dream to a brown person except a dream of America leaving us alone? For I don't want America no more. I want to be a citizen of something new. I want a country for the I want a country for the immigrant hero. I want a country where joy is as indigenous as the people. I want a country that keeps its word. I want to not be scared to drink the water. I want a country that don't bomb other countries. I want a country that don't treat its people like a virus. I want a country not trying to cure itself of me. I want a country that treat my mama right. I want a land where my sister can be free. I want a country that don't look at me and my man and think of all the ways that we can and should burn. I want a nation under a kinder God. I want justice, the verb, not justice, the dream. I want what was promised to me. I want 40 acres and a boat that matters. I want no more prisons and a mule. I want all lives to matter. I want to be over race, but race ain't over me. I want peace. I want equity. I want guns to be melted into a mosque, a church, a place for us to pray. And I want to stop praying for my country to be mine, for it to put the gun down, take the bomb back five. Hope is hard. 
but I have it. I look at my students' hands and imagine all that they will mother. Oh Christ, oh God, I was named to raise to. Oh Allah, oh sweet Lord of my father. Oh all you gods of the homies and all you gods of strangers work together. Build us into tools so that we may build us any other world but this. Make us so that we may make us a world we can be grateful for, not grateful in spite of. Let us not be idle or stunned by fear. Let us not be so comfortable that we ignore another's grieving instead of ending what makes her grieve. Let us not be scared because the work is hard. Let us move the mountain because the mountain must be moved. Let us, lords above us and within, let us be grateful for our neighbors and tender their wounds. Let us be more bandaged than blade unless the blade is needed. Then let us be a sword against all that does not bring us closer to home. Let us be dangerous to all that fails us and bring us a world that is good to us. All of us, all us, all us, amen. Dear white America, I've left Earth in search of darker planets, a solar system that revolves too near a black hole. I left a patch of dirt in my place. Many of y'all won't know the difference. Give him my name if it makes you feel better while you run a hand through his soiled scalp. I've left Earth in search of a new God. I do not trust the God you've given us. My grandmother's hallelujah is only outdone by the fear she nurses each time the blood fat summer swallows another child who used to sing in the choir. Take your God back. Though his songs are beautiful, his miracles are inconsistent. I want the faith of Lazarus for Ranisha. I want Chucky, Bo, Mo, Sean, Trayvon, Janila risen three days after their entombing. Their ghosts re-gifted flesh and blood. Their flesh and blood re-gifted their children. I've left Earth. I'm equal part sick of your go back to Africa as I am your I just don't see races. Neither did the poplar tree. We did not build your boats, though we did leave a trail of kin to guide us home. We did not build your prisons, though we did, and we filled them too. We did not ask to be part of your America, though are we not America? Her bones brittle, dress ripped, dragging her dead child through Oakland. I am sick of standing this ground. I will not call your recklessness the law. Each night I count my brothers, and in the morning when some don't survive, to be counted, I count the holes they leave. Your master, magic trick, America. Now he's breathing, now he don't. Abracadaver, white bread voodoo, this sorcery you claim not to practice. Hand my cousin a pistol to do your work. I tried, white folks. I tried to love y'all, but you spent my brother's funeral making plans for brunch, talking too loud next to his bones. You took one look at the river plump with the body of boy after girl after sweet child and asked why does it always have to be about race? Cause you made it that way. Cause you put an asterisk next to my sister's gorgeous face, call her pretty for a black girl. Cause black girls go missing without a whisper of where. Cause there are no amber alerts for amber skinned girls because Jordan boomed and Emmett whistled and Huey P spoke it and Martin preached it because black boys have always been too loud to live because it's taken my father's time, my mother's time, my aunt's time, my uncle's time, my brother's time, my sister's time, my aunt's time, my uncle's time. How much time do you need for this progress? I've left earth and I won't stop until I find a place where my kin can be safe, until black people ain't but people the same color as the good, wet earth, until that means something. Until then, I bid you well, I bid you war, I bid you our lives to gamble with no more. I've left earth, and I am touching everything you beg your telescopes to show you. I am giving the stars their right names in this new life you cannot see or study, or steal, or chain, or, sh or ship, or whip, or hang, or burn, or mutilate, or redline, or Jim Crow, or shoot, 
or jail or shoot or jail or shoot or jail or shoot or jail or shoot or shoot or choke or shoot or shoot this if only this one is ours. All right, uh, thank y'all for being a great audience. Uh, I'm gonna do, and thank you, Fierce Flower, for bringing me out here. I'm gonna do one more poem, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, let's make a movie called Dinosaurs in the Hood. Jurassic Park meets Friday meets the pursuit of happiness. There should be a scene in it where, the little boy, where there's a little black boy on the bus playing with a toy dinosaur, then looks out the window and sees a T-Rex because there has to be a T-Rex. Duh, motherfucker, it's a dinosaur movie. What the shit did you think was gonna happen? <laughs> don't, no, don't let Tarantino direct this. In his version, the boy plays with a gun. The metaphor being that black boy's toy with their own lives, the foreshadow to his end, the spitting image of his father, fuck that. The kid is playing with the plastic triceratops or brontosaurus, and this is his proof of magic, or God, or Santa, or some magical dinosaur fucking Santa, I don't know. I want a scene where a cop car gets pooped on by a pterodactyl. I want a scene where a corner store turns into a battleground, but please don't let the Wayans brothers in this movie. I don't want any racist shit about Asian people or overused pan-Latino stereotypes. This is a movie about a neighborhood of royal folks, the children of slaves and immigrants and addicts and exiles, saving their town from real ass dinosaurs. I don't want some cheesy yet progressive, sexy Vietnamese hot dude hero with a funny yet strong black girl buddy cop film. This is not a vehicle for Will Smith and Sofia Vergara. I want grandmas on the front porch taking out raptors with the guns they hid in the walls and under mattresses. I want Cecily Tyson to make a speech, possibly two. I want some of those little spitty, screamy dinosaur things that go <laughs> I want Viola Davis to save the town in the last scene with a black fist afro pick through the last dinosaur's long, scaled neck. And this can't be a black movie. Uh-uh, this movie can't be dismissed because of its cast or its audience. This movie can't be a metaphor for black people in extinction. This movie can't be about race. This movie can't cause black people pain or be about black pain. This movie can't be about a long history of having a long history with hurt. This movie can't be about race. Nobody can say nigga in this movie who can't say it to my face in public. No chicken jokes in this movie. No bullet holes in the heroes and nobody kills the black boy and nobody kills the black boy and nobody kills the black boy for once. Nobody kills the black boy besides. The only reason I want to make this is for the first scene anyway. That little black boy on the bus with his toy dinosaur, his eyes wide and endless, his dreams possible and pulsing. And right, right there. There you go. Extra credit, the whole lot of you. Extra credit, everybody gets an A. I wish my daddy could see you in that Kappa jacket saying that. Oh, thank you. For that. <laughs> hey, thank you, Professor Ford. Another question or comment? Yes. This is the man who was whoo, whoo, the whole thing, the whole time, right? You enjoyed it, didn't you? 
enjoyed it. I yes. really enjoyed it. Yes, I did. Um, I'm wondering when you're writing <laughs> when you're writing the pieces that you get so very um, physically involved in. Do you develop a character? before you start writing, or does that come from the words that you're putting onto the page? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, not typically. Um, I'm not, uh, I don't do a lot of persona work, um, so I think anything uh, that I say, typically it's in my own voice, um, you know? Uh, and even when I do write a persona, it's just like some weird corner of myself. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a character in mind, and I think it's always for me about um, the writing of the poem first, and then that physicality comes second that comes to life in that second life of the poem. What's up? Stand up. <laughs> I'm curious about the space that you create for yourself when you start to write. Like mm -hmm. what do you find, you know, you do like silence, you can do like a fly or... Um, yeah, I was just talking about this earlier. Uh, it depends on where my life is at the moment. So like uh, when I lived in California, um, I didn't really have a lot of time to write. I had a very demanding job, but like my time to write was um, in the 20 minutes to and from work. Um, so I would just stand on the train and like pump out something in my notes on my phone and that was how I wrote poems for about a year. Um, excuse me. Uh, and so that was fun. Uh, and so now I, I don't really like silence too much. Um, I like a lot of music, um, you know, either instrumentals or singing. I can't do rap because it sounds like somebody talking and then I wind up just retyping what Kendrick Lamar just said. Um, <laughs> But sometimes it's just, it'd be great. I could probably win a lot of book awards doing that, but uh, <laughs> eventually somebody would catch me. Um, I think the silence comes, um, silence to me is what comes in like the actual reading of the poem. So after I write for a little bit, once I get stuck, I need to hear it out loud. And that's the point where I, the only sort of musicality I want going on is the music of the poem. Um, but I need a lot of, a lot of noise, um, something very comfortable to sit on, a cup of tea that I make but do not drink. Um, <laughs> It's something about the process of making tea it makes me want to write. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Sometimes whiskey, yeah. Um, depends on from poem to poem. Um, so like sometimes a poem just shows up fully formed and you were just kind of like the vessel for it to come through the world. Um, sometimes it's a little harder, you know, sometimes it's uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eighty-five drafts um, before you actually get the poem right. Um, and then I think, uh, so that's, and then I think sort of that uh, natural off the cuffness feel is a different life and performance. So the first time I perform a poem is usually typically a little bit more sterile. I'm staring at the page. I'm trying to figure out if I know the words at all. And the more and more I can look up from the page and like once it's actually in my body, then it's a kind of another performance. So like Dinosaurs in the Hood, the last one, the last two poems I've been, I've written, they're like, oh, what, it's 2016, right? Um, so those are about two and a half years old each. Um, and so I've been performing those for a little while longer. And so now, like since I kind of, they've been in my body for a while, I'm able to do a little bit more and like give it more of that natural flow. Um, so yeah, so I think for writing, it's about one thing, but then in the performance life, once you get, the more comfortable you get with reading something, the more, le the less you have to be right here, then the more you can be right here, so, yeah. What's that? Uh, I have gotten backlash, um, I invite it, because uh, that typically means that somebody who I meant to be talking to was listening, um, and it's a very hard thing to like hear a poem about how like stupid or racist you are, uh, and so, <laughs> um, and I understand that, and you know, I, I invite that anger, you know, I think, um, uh, I, think, uh, I think I want to make people angry um, in a lot of ways, you know, I'm very glad that like, people enjoy the work, but I'm more excited by people who feel challenged or pushed by the work. Because um, that's what it is about. I don't want people to have a comfortable experience. I want people to emote. And so I think that sign of pushback is actually a sign that somebody's really engaging with the work. And you know, maybe in that instant they're angry at me, but the hope is that they'll, that because of that anger, because they felt uh, uh, affected in some way by the poem, that it will stay with them for a while. And maybe that is the first slow step towards um, an attitude shift or a ideological shift. Um, has it made me change my poems? No, if, only, if anything, it's made me want to piss them off more. Um, 
or sometimes I guess maybe uh, I've written more tender stuff that wants to invite people in and not be so accusatory, but I'm also just a shady motherfucker in my life, and so I don't really... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know like, how it started. Did it start kind of small? You kind of introduced those things? Or have you always just been like, this is the way I feel? And I'm, just, I'm curious about that. Yeah. I, mean, I love it, but I'm just curious if like, it's a growth thing or if it's just always how you've been. I think it's kind of always, I've been a real loud mouth my entire life. Um, so it's always kind of been there, at least with the political work. I think the harder thing for me to get comfortable with was doing uh, more personal pieces in front of people. Um, and I think today, if I'm right, I did a much, a, like a very like topic heavy set. Um, so I didn't really do like maybe too many poems about like myself per se, but like a lot of my published work is confessional and like deals a lot with like my personal life. And I think that was actually the hardest step to how to move beyond, like it's very easy for me to talk about racism, right? I can attack an, an abstract concept um, very easily, but I think the harder thing to engage with is to like give somebody a piece of myself, and that's maybe what took more time to become comfortable with. Oh, wait, yeah, you already asked a question. Yeah, you can. Um, you seem so confident in your work and your points. Have you always had that confidence, or did that take a while to build? Um, sometimes it's a facade. A lot of the time, uh, you know, half the time I'm like nervous as fuck up here, but, uh, <laughs> but I try to uh, err on the side of confidence, um, or at least to give that presentation. Um, but I think it does take work. And I think um, like for individual, like any poem that I'm like nervous to share, I know that um, there are certain groups of pe certain people that I share my work with first. Um, and I think once I have like, there's like a group of like 10 folks and like if I have a couple of their stamps of approval on something, then I'm fine. The world can think whatever it wants to think, but the people that I like respect and like am writing for in a particular kind of way, like it, then it's cool. Yeah. Um, is there a, a difference in your process when you're writing uh, spoken word slam poetry and then your published work or more like on the page versus? Um, not really. Um, I think uh, I had a mentor um, when I was in college that was also sort of like doing both spoken word and um, literary page stuff, whatever you want to call it, um, who said a poem is a poem and who gives a shit, you know? Uh, if your poem, like if your poem is only good when somebody reads it, that's just as bad as if your poem is only good when you read it. Um, and so I think for myself, I just try to write the poem however the poem wants to be written. Um, and once I get to the end of that, then, it, then I can figure out, okay, like, it, does this lend itself easily to performance? Um, would I have to work really hard to get a performance? Or sometimes you just write a poem and it's like, you know what, I'm not going to perform this. And I'm just going to leave this for people to like, read um, on their own. And that just has a lot to do with, like, about, with questions about accessibility. Um, you know, when I'm performing a poem, you will hear it one time through. And so the poems that I do are typically poems that I want you to be able to grab as much of the poem as possible through that one reading of it. And I'm gonna leave my stuff that maybe you have to decode a little bit more that might have more complexities and nuances going on. I'm gonna let you take that home and read it four times by yourself, right? Um, so it's just really a question of how you wanna engage with that with your audience um, and thinking about just, you know, the type of space that you're gonna be doing that work in. But just, you gotta write the poem the way the poems wants to be written. Okay, one more question. Yes. I noticed that some of your poems were numbered, and I was just wondering, like, what kind of like, role that had in actual poems, like, why some of them were numbered, some of them were just kind of like, what the point of the numbers? Yeah. Uh, sometimes I think, uh, you know, like the dogs one is like numbered because uh, it's not, it doesn't necessarily read well if you don't separate them in some type of way. Um, and so actually like if you read the poem like on, in like a book or like on my iPad, like it doesn't actually have numbers. It just has like little slashes that denote that like this is a different thought. Um, but when I'm reading it to you, I, I can't necessarily like just like pause for 10 seconds and start again. I could be whack. Um, and, so, and so I just do the numbers in that way just to say like, hey, still part of the same larger thought, but these are like the individual segments or fragments of that thought. And so that's where the numbers come from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fabulous. This is an amazing reading. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
the meds will be back there and mm -hmm. we'll sign a book for you. Uh, those of you who just want to come up and touch him. Ask. Ask for 